We're going to go on to our second presentation of today, which is by uh, Dr. Jody Hayden Perilla, uh, who is an assistant professor at in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Delaware. Um, uh, Dr. Hayden Perilla has uh, really her research focuses largely on using computational simulations to study the um, mechanisms of biological machines and especially things involving carbohydrate binding. She uh, did her PhD training with uh, Professor Rob Woods at the CCRC down at the University of Georgia and then continued with postdoctoral training uh, at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois and at Urbana-Champaign before going on to start her independent career at the University of Delaware. And today she's going to talk about a really fascinating topic which is the fuzzy boundaries of carbohydrate binding sites and carbohydrate binding proteins. And with that, I'll turn the, the floor over to her. Thanks for this nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to be here today and tell you a little bit about my work. Um, I'm Jody Haddon Parigia, an assistant professor at the University of Delaware, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I just opened my research lab last summer, so we're just kind of now getting really seriously up and running. Um, the work I'm going to tell you about today, it's computational work, and it's it's based on a method that we developed for something completely different that we're now finding applications for uh, with respect to carbohydrate binding and in particular the sort of fuzzy boundaries of carbohydrate binding sites. So the first thing I'm going to do is introduce the method, which is which was published last year in the Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling. And this method was really born out of the need to do high performance analysis of biomolecular containers which are, you know, maybe virus capsids, uh, lipid vesicles, these types of things. Um, so if you want to check out the method, uh, the, the publication is out there. Um, it's it's kind of got a lot of math in it, but it's still pretty accessible. They scolded us for making it a little too tutorialish. There's a lot of code snippets in it. So I, I think it's it's quite accessible to most people if you want to want to check out kind of the original original uh, purpose of this. Um, and like I said, it was it was kind of born out of the need to deal with these these large biomolecular containers. And these, these containers are exactly what they sound like. They're objects that can contain things, and they're composed of biomolecules. And we were my colleague and I running simulations of intact virus capsids and viral envelopes. For example, the hepatitis B virus capsid, which you see a cross section of here in panel B, and the HIV capsid that you see a cross section of in panel E, and a realistic HIV vesicle shown in panel F. And we were interested in dealing with these things as containers. If you don't know what a virus capsid is, it's a protein shell that encases the genome of the virus. And although our simulations of these capsids were empty in the sense that they didn't contain genome, there's still solvent inside. There are explicit water and ions that we use to mimic the native physiological environment of, of these biomolecular containers. And we were interested in answering questions like, well, for all this water and ions are in the system, are they moving in and out of the capsid? Are the ions moving in and out? Can we track these rates of solvent exchange? And in order to do that, what we needed was a mechanism for allowing the computer to detect what is meant by inside versus outside of a container. And as humans, that's really obvious to us, but there wasn't a great way to, to teach a computer how to do this. And so, uh, and, and, and not only just detect inside versus outside, but do it in a way that was incredibly high performance so that we could apply it to systems that had millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of particles. And so the measure volunteer method was born. And again, it's, it's a method for de uh, determining what, con what constitutes inside versus outside of a container. And the way it works is um, the space around your molecular structure is voxelized. So it's, it's basically a, a three-dimensional grid is superimposed on your structure. And uh, each little cube in the grid is called a voxel. And from the center of each of these voxels, a series of rays are cast. Now, you can sort of think of this as being analogous to like shining a flashlight. You have like this beam of light, you're casting a ray, and you can imagine shining the light around and seeing where, where the ray falls in the end. What does it strike? And so we cast these series of rays from every voxel, and depending on 
uh, whether the rays strike the molecular surface or if they escape to the bounding box, which is ultimately the, the far outside of our system, we can classify whether that voxel of origin is inside or outside of the container. So if you need the analogy, it's kind of like if you're a kid and your parents let you set up a tent in the living room and pretend you're camping. And so you and your friends are all inside the tent and you all have your flashlights, the door of the tent is closed, everybody's shining their flashlights around and the, the, these rays, the beams of the flashlight are all falling on the surface of the tent. The, the rays, none of these rays are escaping to the outside. They're all blocked by the tent. So you know you're inside the tent. Now if we think about coming outside of the tent, now everybody's casting their, their rays around, shining their flashlight beams. Some of those beams will hit the tent. Others will hit the wall of the room that you're inside. You're now outside of the tent. So obviously the tent in this case is, is your biomolecular container and the wall of the room is this bounding box of, of your system here. Um, and so depending on where your, your ray strikes, you can determine if you're inside or outside. And um, in the original implementation of Measure Volunteer, it really depended on a single ray escaping to the outside for a voxel to be considered as being on the exterior of the container. So if you see in the, the panel on the left side, the panel on the left hand side here, we see an example of two different voxels from which two rays have been cast. So this one that's on in obviously inside the capsid, uh, that you know, both of these rays, they they strike the container, they're blocked by the interior surface of the biomolecule, they don't escape to the outside. This voxel is then classified as being inside the container. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this this other example voxel has one of its rays strike the molecular surface, but the other ray escapes all the way to the bounding box. So this voxel gets classified as being outside of the container. And so these, these rays, they're cast from voxels, and it's ultimately they either strike, strike the molecular surface or they escape to outside. And that's how we decide if space is in or out of a container. And so this all depends on the molecular surface. And so uh, this is the same molecular surface that you can visualize in uh, visual molecular dynamics. I should have said this method is implemented in visual molecular dynamics, VMD, which is a, a widely used, freely available software for the visualization and analysis of biomolecules. It's implemented natively as one of the many measure commands in VMD. So it's, it's measure volunteer. And the parameters that you need to pass to it are parameters that describe the molecular surface, the radius scale, the density isovalue, the grid spacing that you usually set when you visualize surfaces. Grid spacing is also uh, telling you sort of how finely gridded your space is, how big the voxels are. And the other parameter that you need is the number of rays. Um, so this is the number of rays that you're casting from every single voxel. Uh, maybe a good recommendation for a starting number of rays is maybe 64, and you can go uh, lower or higher than that, depending on your system. All of these parameters are really kind of system dependent. The best thing to do is sit down with your system and sort of adjust these parameters to get the most accurate results. Now, there was a problem with the original implementation of Measure Volunteer. And that problem was that it only required a single ray escaping for a voxel to be classified as being outside. And so this presented a problem for containers that were discontinuous or containers that, that were open or that had holes in them. So this was a problem for me. I was running simulations of the intact hepatitis B virus capsid, which you see a cross section of in panel A. And as you can see in the surface, this thing has really big pores. And so lots of the rays were escaping through the pores and the space inside was being misclassified as being uh, outside. So, you know, we said, well, you know, one way you can deal with this is you can increase your radius scale, you can puff up the surface and make it bulky, bulky and ultimately uh, close up and, and uh, obscure these pores and block the rays. But that in that case, you lose accuracy. So there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. So we started thinking that, well, from every voxel, we're casting a whole series of rays. And those rays all have these different outcomes it might be that we can get something from the statistics of those raycast outcomes. So that's what we did. So um, this, this new method is called fuzzy boundary detection. And instead of a voxel being sort of black and white binary inside or outside, now what's assigned to a voxel is a probability that tells you sort of how inside is something. It's a probability that's based on the statistics of the outcomes of the raycasts. And it tells you how inside something is, how occluded is that space from the exterior? How likely is it that it's really inside? And in that case, you can uh, decide on a threshold of that probability to use to delineate inside and outside and say, any, uh, okay, so 
uh, anything that's above this threshold of being occluded, we're going to consider that inside. And that allows you to define a boundary, even in a container that has open holes. And so um, this is the application of fuzzy boundary detection to hepatitis B virus capsid on the right, um, which has these, these pores, as we said. So panel B is the Zika virus uh, envelope proteins that force, form sort of an outer shell on the virus. We've removed entire subunits, and you can see that even though some of the rays escape, that we're able to delineate inside versus outside. So started thinking about other things we can do with this method. Well, let me just say, um, so this, this is a nice figure to look at because um, it, it, it's using the map that's generated by measure volunteer that, that uh, indicates the probability of voxels being inside or outside. Here we've used that map to make atom selections on solvent molecules that are around this protein. And you can see that uh, the, the water molecules with the, the highest probability of being sort of the, the, the most occluded in the binding pocket, they're, they're shown here in purple. And if we uh, decrease our probability threshold a little bit, we can go a little bit farther out. And a little bit farther out, we have sort of these onion layers of space around this, this cleft in the binding pocket that are telling us how occluded that space is, how likely is it that it's inside. And if you want to run measure volunteer with fuzzy boundary detection, you add this uh, prob map flag on the, that you see on the bottom here. And um, so an another thing that this, this does that is really, really useful is it allows you to deal with, of course, these, these fuzzy boundaries. And it solves, it solves this longstanding problem of how, how do you define the edge of a binding site in, in, a, in a protein binding site. So there, there are many softwares already available that will give you the volume of a binding site. There's, there's absolutely a ton of them. There's Pavme and F Pocket and uh, Caver and Hole and there's there's just a bunch of them, but what this method brings to the table that's novel is it provides a physical basis for delineating where the binding site starts and stops. So you can imagine you know, if this is our binding site, we want to measure the volume of it. Where does it stop? Does it stop here? Does it stop here? Where do we draw that line? Anything we we guess is completely arbitrary, but in this case, we have a physical basis to delineate the edge of that binding site. And it's based on the, the physical properties of the molecule and the, the topology of the region and the way the molecule is influencing the space around the binding site. So now that we can deal with binding sites that are fuzzy, you know, uh, I should point out that, you know, as, as was said in my introduction, you know, I, before I did virus capsids and large scale protein simulations, I did carbohydrates. I, I got all my original training in the modeling and simulation of carbohydrate molecules. I, I did carbohydrates first. So they're always in the back of my mind, like what's going on with carbohydrates. And so I started thinking about the application of this method to carbohydrate binding sites, which in a lot of cases can be kind of fuzzy. So if we think about the different types of proteins that bind carbohydrates, um, there are some examples here. One, one example is an enzyme. And enzymes tend to have sort of more distinct clefts or pockets that, that bind, bind carbohydrates. They kind of, you know, bury the sugar and desolvate it and exclude the water for efficient catalysis. Anything that transports a carbohydrate tends to have a deeper, deeper pocket, more defined for tighter binding. But if we start to think about lectins, we know that lectins tend to have weaker binding interactions that they, their binding sites might just be these shallow depressions and only really one or two uh, uh, sugar units might fit in those binding sites. You know, they, they have fuzzier edges. Now, uh, antibodies are another example of, of binding sites that are maybe not well-defined in the sense of being sort of this distinct pocket. Um, and here's some examples here on the, on the bottom of the slide. Um, you know, these antibodies that recognize carbohydrates, they have these, these loops. And you might just get sort of a shallow region or even just a groove within those loops where the carbohydrate binds. And so where do you, how do you define the edges of binding sites like this? Well, measure volunteer with fuzzy boundary conditions is capable of doing this. So we started applying it uh, to a few systems and I'll show you a few of these now. The first system we tried it on was influenza hemagglutinin, which is a great friend of mine from graduate school. I used to study this binding interaction and uh, Influenza hemagglutinin is the spike protein on the surface of the flu virus that's responsible for its adhesion to host cells. So it, it uh, binds host cell receptor glycans in these binding sites you see here. This is just the terminal disaccharide of the larger glycan that it binds. And uh, this guy, you know, has sort of weaker interactions. It depends on avidity to make a strong adhesion. So it was a good test case. And so we can apply measure volunteer with fuzzy boundary detection. 
and we can apply a probability threshold to decide where the binding site is going to start and stop according to our measurement. And here we have a threshold of 0.5, which is probably pretty generous, but just to sort of give you a basis for looking at this, it's sort of covering up everything. It's maybe protruding a little bit beyond the binding site. So we increase it and we see that the region, this region, which is kind of a, a probably a, a more fair estimate for this system in blue, probability of 0.6 is sort of really describing the more occluded region. We start to see the galactose peaking out of that. Um, and then we can crank up the probability even higher and we get these regions that are sort of more, more and more occluded down in the pocket. And we, we can't go much beyond 0.7. We just don't get the density for it anymore. Uh, the pocket is really just not that, that deep. And so um, you know, this gives us a way to measure the volume of these binding sites, but also sort of to, to learn something about depth in the binding site and the regions that are deep, not in terms of a distance of depth, but really how occluded space is by the topology of the binding site. So another system that we've tried this on is influenza neuraminidase. If you are interested in hemagglutinin, you're probably also interested in neuraminidase. This is the other protein on the surface of the flu virus. And it's, a, it's an enzyme, it's a salidase. It cleaves off sialic acids from those uh, host cell receptor glycans that the flu binds to. And that's important for the escape of progeny flu variants. Here we have it crystallized with Tamiflu in the binding sites. Tamiflu is a glycomimetic that mimics the, the native uh, silic acid substrate. And so we apply measure of all interior. And again, we can start out with sort of a, a generous probability threshold where it's kind of too much for the system, but we, we can scale it up to these more occluded regions. And you see that we can go up actually to a pretty high probability here because this is an enzyme. It's got a, a deep cleft. The, the Tamiflu is kind of really up under part of this protein. And so we have regions that are quite deep and occluded from the exterior in this way. And we can measure the volumes of these. Another system that I think is pretty interesting to apply this to is cell 7A. This is a system I worked on briefly as a postdoc before I transitioned to, to viruses. And cell 7A is a cellobiohydrolase. It's an enzyme that processes cellulose. You have chains of glucose uh, from cellulose that feed into this, this um, this sort of entryway, and there's a tunnel that runs through this enzyme. The cellulose, the glucose chain feeds through and towards the back of the tunnel is catalytic machinery, which uh, cuts, uh, cuts off units of cellobios that come out of the back of this enzyme. So if we apply our method to this tunnel, uh, we can again start out with sort of this generous probability threshold, but we're we're capturing a good bit of the tunnel here. This this part is sort of extending along the surface of, of the protein is maybe a little too much. We should probably increase this threshold. But something neat about increasing the threshold in, in this type of enzyme is, you know, in the center of this threshold, uh, it's sorry, in the center of this, this protein, in the center of this binding site, the, these regions where the, the carbohydrate is bound are really, really, really hidden from the, from the exterior. So we can go up to a probability of 0.99 where basically none of the rays we are casting are escaping. And this is, this is right up close to where the catalytic machinery is that cuts off the, the, the cellobios here. So this is a neat way to analyze this system and measure the, we can measure the volume of the tunnel in this way. Um, the last system I'm going to show you is an anti-tumor an antibody. Remember we talked about antibodies having this challenge of binding sites maybe not being very well defined for carbohydrates just based on these sort of loops that recognize them. This is, uh, it's an IgG fab fragment with a uh, complex with, I think, a derivative of Lewis Y. And so it's got this kind of, you know, little pocket there, but part of this binding site is really just a groove. And so the question is, how do we, how do we measure that groove? Can we get the groove with our method? And the answer is that we can. We have to use kind of a lower probability threshold to do that because it's not a very occluded space. It's quite exposed on the protein surface, but we can capture it and we can measure it. And um, you know, if we increase the probability, of course, we get only really the, the really deep regions of this. But uh, by tuning this threshold parameter, we can really define a binding site that has fuzzy edges and characterize you know, what really constitutes this binding site and, and measure its volume and learn something about residues that are, or not even the residues, it's really the space around the protein that is mostly occluded by the surrounding residues. So um, this work is, is, is just something that we have in progress. It's, it's a little, it's a little hairy right now. It needs some refinement. Um, and one of the issues is, you know, we developed this method for application to large systems. You know, if you, if 
you have a virus capsid that's, you know, tens of nanometers in, in diameter, you know, and you're trying to measure the interior space, if you're off by an angstrom here or there, it's, it's not a big deal because that's, that's a relatively small error in your overall measurement. But if we're doing binding sites, you know, every little angstrom counts. So we're really having to work on tuning these parameters to make it so that we can get the, the most accurate description of the space as possible. Another, th another thing we, we're working on is reducing noise in the volume measurements. And what I mean by that is, if you look at this, this uh, image here uh, with the cyan, you see there's little, little blobs of density that are considered inside that is not really what a human would say is inside this binding site. So um, notice on the surface of this molecule, you know, there, there are many other sort of depressions and grooves and all sorts of other interesting topological features along this protein. Measure volunteer captures those at, at a probability threshold that's this low. So getting this accurate measurement of just the region around the binding site depends on cropping the map around the binding site. So we're working out the best ways to do that in an automated fashion that uh, give us accurate results without introducing bias. Um, Another thing I wanted to point out, if you were paying attention on my cell 7A slide, you might have wondered, well, Jody, you know, didn't we miss part of the binding site here? This bit of the ligand is sort of exposed in the center. And the, the answer to that is this is an artifact of visualization. The map actually captures that region, but the way that we're, we're using to visualize and show our results is by uh, using this sort of surface representation that we make from the map. And it doesn't exactly match the map right now. And the map is much harder to look at. We like the surface, the surface representation to present the results. So um, the, the visualization of this and the, the data presentation also needs refinement. So people really believe us that you know, we're getting these really accurate classifications of space. So that's another thing we're working out. We need more testing on additional trickier systems with fuzzier binding sites. If you know a fun system with a really fuzzy binding site, please recommend it to us. We'd like to give it a, a shot and see how we do. Um, we also need to try this on more molecular dynamics trajectories. Obviously, when you uh, run a simulation, your binding site is changing, especially if you have the apoform protein, you know, there might be side chains we're moving in and out of the binding site, or the whole thing is just sort of, you know, changing in its topology over time. And, uh, you know, you have to make sure you choose parameters that are going to fly for all the conformers that you have over the course of your trajectory. So we need some more testing there to sort of optimize our method. And, you know, we're, we're really interested in comparing our results with other characterizations of binding sites that are often used to, to investigate or, or detect binding sites, in particular those that bind carbohydrates. This includes solid and accessible surface area, solvation potential, contacts, all these types of things, hydrophobicity, to just see how this stacks up. And kind of the ultimate goal of this is to really streamline it, make it automated and user friendly and not just something that a computational person would use. We envision this being a tool that any experimentalist could, could run on a, a protein that they download from the protein data bank. So, you know, you have your structure and you just want to learn something about the binding interaction. So uh, expect soon a forthcoming manuscript where we sort of lay down the, the sort of rules of thumb standardized method for applying this to small systems and um, after that, you know, the, the goal is to use it. Let's use it and see if there's something new that we can learn about carbohydrate binding interactions by analyzing them in this way and really not even analyzing the, the molecules, not, not the, the carbohydrate ligand or, or the protein, but the space in between them. So um, we hope you like our method. We hope you'll be interested in using it when we get some of the kinks worked out. Um, I, I do want to add, if, if you are a computational person who wants to apply this to a molecular dynamics trajectory, like rest assured this method is really, really fast. Like we, we had a, a paper come out a week or two ago where we applied measure volunteer to 150 nanometer authentic HIV viral envelope, which contains to 29 million martini particles. We ran this on the fastest supercomputer that's on a university campus right now. And it absolutely screams. If you're gonna run it on a small system, this is something that's really, really accessible for you to, to run and get really accurate results from just on your workstation in your lab. So with that, um, I'll conclude. I would like to acknowledge uh, you know, some of the, the various collaborators we have involved in our work. These are, these are collaborators involved in all sort of aspects of our, of our work, the viruses, the molecular motors, our accessibility work. The people who are most relevant to the work uh, that was presented here are Juan Parija, Tyler Reddy, and John Stone. Uh, Juan Parija and Tyler Reddy collaborate on large systems and analysis methods for those. John Stone is the major developer 
of visual molecular dynamics, the software, and participated in the final implementation of this code there. You know, we're really grateful for our funding and all the, the supercomputer time that really pushes our large system work forward. And this is my little research group. We've been in business uh, just since uh, summer of 2019. Carolina is my graduate student and Olivia is, my, is an undergrad who've been with me from the very beginning. We have Ross and Jolly and Santiago who are students we've recruited to start next fall who are sort of already getting you know, involved in remote research. And we also have rotation students, uh, Stephanie and Peter here. And uh, Stephanie in particular, I'd like to credit with some of the really beautiful images you saw today. So with that, I'm really happy to take your questions and any feedback you have on our method. Thank you.